You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Today we are joined by Zach Ryle and Arun Singh of the Serum Visions podcast for the conclusion of Project Resurgent Belief. Was our faith in enchantment reanimation finally rewarded? We also take a look at the 14 nominees for next month's card. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Schriever, also known as Cave Dan Online. I'm joined today by some familiar faces. First up, coming to us from a beautiful port in New Orleans, it's Zach Manasymbol Ryle. Hey, how you doing, Dan? How am I doing? How are you doing? I'm good. It's great to hear your voice. It's been a while. It has been a little while, uh, not too long since my last appearance, but uh, we're back, and we've got a lot of uh, <laughs> exciting Serum Vision related card choices, uh, a, a group that I had some association with, so I just had to be here for one of these, and I'm so glad that I get to be. A group that I had some association with, <laughs> the Serum Vision's <laughs> legacy. Before you abandoned us. Well, I just, I've listened to every episode that you've done with your collaboration with Arun and Brian, and I love that. Um, but it's always been like, oh, the guys from Serum Visions, you know, Brian and Arun, dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, all right, I, I, I see, I see, I see you. I see how you're doing this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you, you also left us for Faithless Brewing. I did not leave you. I was doing both at the same time and editing. Yeah, that is true. But, you know, I mean, Faithless Brewing is just, it's the bigger fish, right? Just so you joined the bigger fish, and so you're known for the bigger fish. Yeah, when they wanted me to go on tour, I had to make some tough choices. Uh, Feelings were hurt. Uh, (laughs) But luckily, there's going to be a a real-life reunion with the person whose voice you're hearing right now. Um, And by reunion, I mean union, because I've never met you in person before. Yeah, this is big. So, of course, Arun Jiggy Wiggy Singh is also here with us. Arun, welcome. Hell yeah, thank you. I was excited to be here. You know, I always love these little reunions. I always love to see Dan and Zach's and sometimes Brian's very pretty faces. But yeah, we are going, Jack and I are going to uh, the big Magic 30 in Vegas and we're going to split a room and we're going to crush uh, and going to go crush a buffet and it's going to be so sick. I'm super excited. <laughs> Crushed the beta draft qualifier and the buffet. Yeah, well, Zach's going to have to crush the beta draft qualifier. I think he can probably probably crush the buffet, but I know I can crush the buffet. I crushed it last time. Exode the Swiss at the buffet. Easy. <laughs> Didn't even ID into top eight, you know? I had two winning ends, and I just crushed them. <laughs> well, hey, I'm super jealous that you guys are going to be at Magic 30 Vegas. I don't know like how many people actually ended up getting tickets for this. I know it sold out immediately, but... Hopefully someone listening to this will also be there and maybe they can find you. Yeah, I'm sure some pictures will happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, gonna make sure we're well known. It'll be sweet. We just need more, except more is stuck in Argentina. Yeah, that's a bit more of a, a hike. Uh, I was shocked to find out that flights to Nebraska for a uh, different reason in December were like twice as expensive as my flight to Vegas. Air, airplane airfares are crazy, man. Huh. Yeah, that's not worth it. Don't buy the flight to Nebraska. Oh, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> advice as an American. <laughs> I already told the guy because I was, I was basically going for an unpaid gig. Uh, and I was like, listen, dude, it's not worth it. Someone's trying to sell you a bill of goods right there. If they're trying to get you to buy it, let's take it to Nebraska. No, I mean, it was going to be a fun week hanging out with a friend and then getting to play uh, like his album release party. But I was like, just find someone local, man. Like, I'd love to do it, but this is, this is not feasible. It's like, I'll put you up for a whole week. I was like, yeah, in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, uh, we've got two thirds of Serum Visions assembled. Unfortunately, Brian could not make it. He wanted to be here. We just couldn't get the schedule to line up with Zach's cruise ship. The Serum Visions Tron didn't come together. It'll come together soon. We're only tapping for two mana. 
But that's all right. We still got a great show coming up. You guys know the drill by now. Once every month or so, month and a half or so, we come together with the guys from Serum Visions to recap our monthly project. And we've been working on the card Resurgent Belief. This is a card that is chosen by the listeners, by our patrons. Uh, we always put the cards up to a vote. And we've got a whole new batch of cards that are nominated for next month as well. There are some spicy ones. Extra spicy. Yeah, really excited to uh, go through this list and uh, see what, what kind of crazy shenanigans result from it. Oh, yes. Uh, so that is the plan of attack for today. We will start off by telling you about some of the resurgent belief decks that we played, some conclusions, tentative or definitive or otherwise, that we drew about the card, and then we will get you hyped up on false promises about the, the new <laughs> cards on the ballot this time around. <laughs> All right, Zach, why don't you kick us off? Tell us about uh, this bring to light resurgent belief deck yeah so resurgent belief uh a card that i tinkered with once upon a time uh so mord had played a bring to light version with a bunch of seals in it um that was you know kind of conservatively built in such a way uh that you you had a reasonable game plan you had a reasonable fair plan and then uh you could either suspend or or uh, bring to light for resurgent belief to get that going on and the thing that I found about his build was that there was nothing exciting about it, and his score was unexciting. And I thought, you know, if you're going to build uh, something that's so conservative, then then um, it's not... I, I don't see it being more exciting than or more powerful than um, Living End. So I was like, well, what if we throw in some slightly more powerful uh, enchantments with the idea of you know, um, seeing if, if we can get a, a bigger payoff for doing so. So Lay Claim was a card that he did not try, that I wanted to try. And uh, then I also threw in, like, a Kiora Best the Sea God. And I think that was the, the bulk of the changes. My league was a 2-3, I believe. But it ended up having some goofy stuff happening in it that was really fun, including um, hard casting a Kiora Best the Sea God to beat to uh, living end in game one even though they crushed me in game yeah. two and game three <laughs> oof yeah well what can you do so before you get into the details of the games let me just paint the picture a little more so we're Please. talking about a deck that has a fair number about what 15 20 cheap enchantments mm -hmm. uh, you have abundant growth because you're playing the sky noodle but you also have looks like seven seals four seal of fire three seal of removal at two mana, you have familiar enchantments like Spreading Seas, but also less familiar ones. I mean, Lay Claim is two to cycle, seven to cast. That just gains control of any permanent. Colossal Sky Turtle, that's here as a four of. That doesn't cycle, but you can channel it for either two or three mana. And then when it comes back off the Resurgent Belief, you'll get a 6-5 Flying Ward 2. And I also see it looks like you're playing three copies of Spirited Companion three Shark Typhoons, and four Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Th those are, uh, that, that's all worth knowing. So, um, yeah, between Colossal Sky Turtle, Shark Typhoon, and I think those are the major cards that are, like, cheap to cycle. They put themselves in your graveyard and get a big payoff for bringing them back, whereas you also have the ones that are cheap to play, Seal of Fire, Seal of Removal, and Abundant Growth, where you can throw those into the graveyard and then, uh, and then they'll come back on your Resurgent Belief. So, you kind of have the the big payoffs that cycle themselves and the small cards that kind of help you stay in the game until you can get to that point. So if the enchantments are like your nonsense package, you also have a portion of the deck dedicated to good cards. So there's four Teferis, four Ren and Six, four Bring to Light as a Velky, because anytime you're playing Bring to Light, you should probably have Velky. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you fit in a few specialists like Supreme Verdict, etc. Yeah, I mean, the Bring to Light package just allows you to have that kind of flexibility. Is this Bluetron? Yeah, yeah, I think I faced Bluetron and Greentron, so I had a really unfortunate run uh, in terms of matchups as well. You know, Living End was going to be tough, um, and yeah, I think it was both Greentron and Bluetron, so definitely <laughs> tough road to hoe. <laughs> um, what year is it? Modern is still modern. Right, and my Spreading Seas had a bad habit of uh, getting murked. Uh, no, they just drew the redundant Tron pieces. It was like one of those horrible situations where it's just like, oh, I, I guess I was not going to win this. Like, the magic gods say no. 
everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Exactly. So this was one of those things where uh, I think Mord had it right to go as conservative as he did and have like play the kind of cards that he chose. And that these larger payoffs just did not end up being worth it. As sweet as it was to hard cast a Kiara Best of Sea God and beat Living End in the game, um, I think Resurgent Belief is just, uh, without the um, plague winding your opponent's side of Living End, it's just, I just can't see how it ever is going to be able to compete. Mm. And enchantment payoffs, it was insane to listen to a recent episode of Athos Brewing and hear Mord and Dan go back and forth on, uh, what's the name of the card that when it enters the battlefield, it reanimates uh, an enchantment? We went, uh, there isn't one. It's like, what, what do you mean there isn't one? How is that possible? There's like 20,000 unique cards. Yeah, it's just um, not a thing, I guess. Whoa. I didn't know that. That's wild. Right. It's just something that, like, it doesn't come up that often, but it's like, oh, right. Hmm. Uh, well, you can't reanimate any enchantment. You can reanimate an aura. Right, or, 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 or a small enchantment. There's Storm Herald for that, and there's actually a new one that's... One of the cards nominated for this month actually can nominate an aura. It's, a, it's Danatha from the new set. Right, right, right. But I'm, I'm just talking, like, Karmic Guide. Like, just do the thing. True. Just do the thing. Like, w uh, let us do the thing. Yeah, I mean, you can pay, like, five mana for Obzidat's aid. Okay. But that's not an ETB, that's just like a spell. Yeah, but that's not an ETB. Like we can't we can't ephemerate that. Like it's it's just it's just one of those goofy things where it's like, why doesn't this exist? Can anyone explain to me why this is not a okay. Whatever, I guess. Don't worry, it'll be in the same place the same set that we get enchantment lands in and Zach. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> non legendary enchantment lands, one in every color, just like Mirna. So yeah, Resurgent Belief, this is a really tough card. Um, we've seen some mildly successful builds, of course, from people like Aspiring Spike, and you can build something that's functional. I think Bring to Light is one of the kind of coolest things that I've never seen anyone else explore with it. And it, it builds a mildly functional deck, but you're vulnerable to a lot of things, and it the payoff's just, it's just not there. And the enchantment creatures that you can cycle, like, then you're just playing an even worse version of Living End, and the quote-unquote powerful enchantments you can choose also not really doing it for me. So, a little disappointed, but that's how she goes sometimes. All right, I want to follow up on the Bring to Light question, because I think that is one of the more unique aspects of resurgent belief, right? We, we don't see bring to light for living end or anything like that. It's not that you can't do it. It's that, you know, the cascade is better. Right. And with enchantments, the kind of the problem is if you want to have stuff to do in the first few turns that is an enchantment, it has to be cheap. You can, you're not going to cascade while also playing Seal of Fire. So did you feel like you were getting five mana worth of card when you cast bring to light for resurgent belief? Uh, I consistently was. Um, you can see the way that, that this deck is built is that you will likely have one or two seals and one or two payoffs by the time that you do that. The, the problem is that you're uh, playing into the graveyard and you can't do that like Living End can do that. So uh, you, you, you are much more vulnerable to a lot of things that can go wrong for a deck as powerful as that one and we're not that good. If that makes sense. Definitely. Hmm. All right. So Zach's iteration on Mord's concepts, similarly, I guess disappointing results. But that's bring to light. I mean, we haven't yet gone to the highest source, namely Shardless Agent, Violent Outburst, just brute force cascade into the suspense spell. So I wanted to make sure that I at least tried this at least once before this project ended. <laughs> and as it happened, uh, thanks to Dominaria United coming out on Magic Online, like we have some new toys to play with. Hmm. Obviously, we like Leyline Binding a lot. <laughs> a lot of other people like it too. The card has skyrocketed in price. But not just that, we also have Temporary Lockdown. This is one white white for an enchantment. It's kind of like an Oblivion Ring for all permanents, CMC2 or less, all non land permanents. So now you have not only cheap spot removal that's enchantments, you have a little sweeper that's an enchantment. We also talked about the card Shadow Prophecy as another way to potentially fill the graveyard while digging for something, you know, your key spell, whether that's Shardless to get Resurgent Belief um, or, you know, Bring to Light, whatever it may be. So between these, I felt like, okay, the, the tools are 
coming together where I can at least talk myself into something that looks a little bit like an enchantment version of Living End, right? Where I, I am playing Cascades, so I'm not playing anything on one or two. Instead, I'm using my first turns to get Triomes for Leyline Binding, or to cycle Lay Claims, to channel my Colossal Sky Turtle, or cycle Cast Out, right? That's the only really semi-plausible one mana cycling enchantment. Mm. If I take that shell, right, four Leyline Binding, four Lay Claim, three Cast Out, three Resurgent Belief, six Cascaders, the so Shardless Agent and Violent Outburst, four Fable of the Mirror Breaker, three Teferis, and a couple Shadow Prophecy. I just wanted to see how this would do. 23 land, and we're rounding the deck out with a little more interaction in the form of Force of Negation. You just need something to interact, because if you compare everything I've talked about to a known deck like Living End, it's just like, it's much slower, right? Like Living End is going to be Street Wraith, Street Wraith, Stripe River Winder. They could potentially cascade and have overwhelming board presence on turn three, whereas the cards I've named are going to be like, okay, Tap Land, Tap Land, Leyline Binding. <laughs> We'll call that a whelming, a whelming board presence. Exactly. It's, it's going to be like a slower thing, right? Nothing I've named so far is efficient. Um, in fact, the only efficient cards are Leyline Binding and, I guess, Force Negation. Yeah. Plunk City. Uh, so this is definitely going to be a slower deck. But, I mean, it has the power, right? Like, if you look at the, the cards in here, they're mostly plausible. You know, if, if we believe in cards like Colossal Sky Turtle, this is a semi-decent collection of cards. Yeah. So this is what I decided to try, and yeah, I mean, I gotta agree with Zach. The results were pretty disappointing. I ended up going two and three in my league. Maybe with a little bit of tighter play, I could have squeezed another match win out of it, but the issue was structural, I felt like. <laughs> like I, I collected a lot of screenshots here, just because I needed to like document everything that happened. And yeah, there were, there were multiple games where... I did the thing, but the thing was, you know, Charlotte's agent returning one cast out. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, okay, well, like, I can't not do it because I'm going to die if I don't. But I didn't feel like I was getting a lot out of my signature card. Not because it couldn't get more, but because like, you, you got to work for it. You got to put your enchantments in the graveyard and they just, they don't naturally put themselves in the graveyard, right? They either ask for a lot of mana or like you just have to draw a bunch of them. Like my total number of cyclers is much lower than Living End would play. Mm. If I want to increase that, I have to cut some of my good cards. Like, yeah, Teferi is off plan. Force Indication is off plan, but these are necessary to keep up. So I actually ended up being like an enchantment deck without that many enchantments. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. I see a nice Force of Vigor screenshot here. Yeah, I mean, I think, Zach, you found this to be the case as well, that people are extremely well prepared, you know, not just for the Cascade angle, but for every aspect of the deck. Right? Yeah, it's uh, it's unfortunate that you are vulnerable to so many different parts of the game all at once. I played against, like, a Rakdos midrange, and, you know, game one, they have Dalty Voidwalkers in their main deck, but I have Leyland Bindings, I have Cast Out, so I'm, I'm not too concerned about that. I can remove some hate pieces and then game two like multiple unlicensed versions come down <laughs> so, okay, there's just too much like there's too much going on multiple force of vigors you know people are coming with boseju against my enchantments uh i will say that it is nice that resurgent belief kind of naturally brings back things that have been destroyed by boseju uh, so just by virtue of the matchups i faced like the line of sanctity ended up being a really good card for me out of my sideboard because I was faced against like a couple of Alicut decks, uh, the Rakdos deck with Discard, and like a, a kind of prowessy burn deck. And yeah, like multiple times I actually got to return with Resurgent Belief the things that my opponent had spent time and mana to destroy. So that was promising, but uh, structurally I was just like starting off on the back foot, and it wasn't as consistently whelming even i didn't even reach the minimum well, power level of, of my average resurgent belief i would say if you are trying to think of the constructed deck that was like oh yeah 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 see that you play your creatures fairly by paying mana for them and then you cascade into living end to get them back it's like that that's never been a thing right it's like <laughs> it's just this is not how it <laughs> this is not how it's done this uh -huh. is not how we do things <laughs> Well, do you remember, like, the older Living End that would play, like, Archfiend of Ifnir yeah. and but, Monstrous Carabids and stuff? Yeah. Like, it was a much slower 
pace. Right. So, <laughs> right. It it was, but at the same time, it wasn't like your your plan wasn't like yeah, I'm gonna play some small crappy creatures and then they're gonna die and then I'm gonna bring them back. It wasn't no, like no, no, no. Um, D and T no, no, with no. Living End. Here's a question, Dan. Do you think you had more access to one mana cycling enchantments that were also a little bit higher in power level? Do you think this strategy might be feasible? Or do you just think the overall concept of an enchantment living end, even with good, cheap cycling enchantments, just wouldn't be viable? Yeah, I do think we need like three upgrades on that front. We need another one mana cycler that is more proactive than cast out, right? Because I also had games where I brought back like multiple cast outs and they had nothing in place. So it was like it. It's almost like they didn't exist. <laughs> we need another one mana thing like that that actually helps you on an empty board. We also need a street wraith, like a free cycler, <laughs> which they're not going to print. But uh, we need something like that. And then we possibly also need a grief. I'm pretty sure we need something like, uh, it needs to say, like, return all enchantments from all graveyards to the battlefield. And you need to put something in your opponent's graveyard that, like, causes them to lose the game if it wasn't cast. Or it needs to like plague wind, mm. like just just give it the living end text of like you get to swap their their battlefield in their graveyard, not for any good reason, just because it needs it. I I agree. I mean that was the other thing that you know we kind of glossed over this, but you know I bring back so many enchantments. I have screenshots where it did work, right? I did win two matches, and even the the times where I brought back all this stuff, like the game didn't end that turn. Right, the game just. <laughs> swung in my favor a little bit but i had to play like four or five more turns like i didn't even necessarily solve their battlefields i didn't present much power so the fact that resolving resurgent belief does not actually interact with your opponents inherently is a problem yeah i mean it has a similar problem to the um versions of what's the the third cascade deck what is that called? It's uh, Glimpse of Tomorrow. Glimpse. The Glimpse of Tomorrow versions that are flipping in like an Emrakul. It's like, yeah, that's cool. Anyway, kill you. Because you don't get the cast trigger. So not ending the game this turn is uh, a big problem. But the thing is, but those ones end the game next turn. You know, Dan is saying, you know, you're almost never going to end the game next turn. You're going to end the game in yeah. four or five turns. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, that's... even the, the Glimpse deck is really powerful. And also, you know, even the non emerical version, it doesn't really ever win that turn unless you get really lucky with your triggers. They normally win the next turn. Like, they set up, yeah. you know, an almost... And, you know, but this is four or five turns down the road is definitely much weaker than winning the yeah. next turn. So, tad unfortunate for you, Resurgent Belief. So I know that you were making up like a very ridiculous sounding card, right? Like an enchantment that comes back and does all this weird stuff. But I do feel like there, there is a potential for a card like that to someday exist. Definitely. Right? Like if it's an 8, 10, or 12 mana enchantment, like Resurgent Belief doesn't actually care. What if they print someday a 12 mana enchantment that actually wins the game from a ridiculous position? Mm. Then we can talk, right? Like I, I did leave feeling like maybe this, you know, cycle you know, fairish effects like lay claim and cast out. That That's kind of the wrong way to do it. And maybe what I should have done was just pick the biggest, most outrageous enchantments I could find. Forget cycling, right? Just focus on um, like Shadow Prophecy, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, like actual looting effects and just try to like, you know, manually put these expensive omniscient style cards into the graveyard. And then you can still cascade for Resurgent Belief, but like, or maybe even that ends up being too much work and maybe you just want to do Obsidat's aid to get the single enchantment back. Spike had a blue-white version that played as foretold, right? And Faithless Mending? That was always pretty intriguing. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I was alluding to when I said there have been some successful brews uh, made. And and we saw the control version before, right? And that was the one that had 5-0'd. That was the only previous 5 Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that Resurgent Belief is a suspend card is a problem because that immediately puts it into this a plus B kind of category where you you can't just play Resurgent Belief. You also have to play something else to actually cast it in a timely way, whether that's As Foretold, whether that's Electrodominance, whether that's Finale of Promise, Fires of Invention, Cascade, Bring to Light, whatever it is, you end up having to dedicate like a bunch of slots in your deck just to Resurgent Belief. <laughs> then you have to find room for an enchantment package that uses the graveyard and there isn't enough overlap right there. Currently, not enough enchantments put themselves in the graveyard, right? So you just run out of deck space. We're getting there. Like Leyland Binding, I think, is an important step. Like I, I did have some impressive turns with it, but we're not there yet. Mm. Fable and Leyland are not enough. Makes sense. 
So, I mean, those are kind of my concluding thoughts on the card. What do you guys think? I mean, what have we learned this month about Resurgent Belief? Um, I would say the best way to play it that we... Like, we, we discovered that playing it with Bring to Light is of uh, moderate value. It's a strategy that feels like it would be at home in a power level uh, for Pioneer. And that's just not the modern we live in. So you can't... like this. <laughs> not, it's just not good enough here. Um, I feel like that's a fair assessment. If it's just like... It's something that maybe would have been okay in like 2016 modern, which again is not the world we live in. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing it seems to come down to is, you know, this cascade strategy, you know, like if you want to cascade into this, you're competing in the same space as Living End and Rhinos, which are hyper efficient, super strong, you know, like some of the best decks in modern. Uh, and, you know, like you're competing with that with just like a weaker card and access to a weaker supporting cast mm. so until that problem is kind of solved you know like even if you can do cool things with it i don't see how this can really you know ever compete with living end and you know maybe maybe around see what more so living end just you know you want to do, you have the exact same incentives but you just have much better payoffs and you get much better disruption right and they're also like the rhinos is essentially a one card combo if 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 i may and uh living end is not it's not that it's a one card combo it's just that it's enabling is so much better like by on its own it just it yep. just it does the thing it wants to do the thing and it does the thing yeah i think that on the unfair axis living end will always be the best and so will glimpse <laughs> way better than research i believe anyway on the fair axis i mean crashing footfalls is currently better someday there might be more enchantments like you know there are plenty of not plenty. There are like six cards that you can play in modern that are enchantments. <laughs> Fable, <laughs> Dryad of the Elysian Grove, Abundant Urza Grove, Saga, Abundant Growth, right? I mean, Seal of Fire, I don't know if you felt like that was a strong card. We didn't even try a build with Saga just because it didn't seem to work with anything else that we were being asked to do, right? If that makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. These cards don't synergize right. with each other. And then you've got the over the top stuff like Overwhelming Splendor and Omniscience, and that. Like, there's just easier ways to do that. Just flip them directly into play. So so I feel like someday, you know, if, if there's enough cards that just happen to be enchantments that are good, yeah, then maybe I could see a deck that has one resurgent belief in it as a bring to light target or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to have four fables, four dryads, four Urza Slagos, four run and six, one resurgent belief. <laughs> I, I don't really know. It doesn't really make sense, right? Because these cards don't fit. Right. And on that... On that note, uh, I feel like they could just print um, Replenish into Modern, and it would do literally nothing. Uh, just, just, mm. I, I just, I just want if anyone from Wizards is listening to this, just go ahead and do it. Like it's gonna be fine. Reserve list. Just, just do it anyway. Screw the reserve list. I've said that repeatedly before. I said burn it to the ground before, and I'll say it again. I mean, there's open the vaults, but that's six. Right. No, just, just print, just print Replenish. Just do the thing. Don't be afraid. Open the vaults for Pioneer would be interesting. Or like, what if a replenish that only gets back sagas? Only gets back sagas. Oh. That that's yeah. kind of funky. I like that. It's crazy, but yeah, it's my kind of crazy. <laughs> all right. Well, I think it sounds like we're all saying a version of the same thing, right? Like the tools are not there yet. Mm. No. <laughs> maybe they never will be. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta believe. <laughs> Good to keep in mind. Man can dream, though. A man can dream. All right, so I think that's all there is to say for now about Resurgent Belief, at least until they give us some better enchantments to work with. But we look forward. It was a good attempt. We tried, and <laughs> you know, we march into the future optimistic. Maybe to help us with that, you know, we need a little injection of youthful energy. And for that purpose, we have our youngest co-host. hey -o. Grandfather of kittens <laughs> is Emmy Sagasti. Mord, welcome. hey -o. Trying to get a kitten to cry, but he's not crying. Why are you trying to get a kitten to cry? That is the worst <laughs> sentence I've heard. In oh, I, I heard a squeak. Oh, wow, you have so... Are you just like all the kittens, Mord? You just do kittens all day? Yes. Look at it! Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That doesn't even look like a cat. It's not cat-shaped yet. They're still so small. Just they look little like fluffs. little hamsters. Just little balls of fluff. Tiny little fluffs. Which one is this? Cats are for sure the cutest that kittens are. Like, you know, they're just the cutest thing in the world, hands down. I love puppies, but kittens are cuter than puppies. Kittens are so cute. This one needs a bath because they smell. <laughs> they tiny little smelly balls. But they're beautiful. 
How are you guys doing? Uh, fantastic. Doing well. Happy to hear you again. Happy to see you again and your wonderful cat pals. Not so happy to be talking about Resurgent Belief, but luckily we're through that and we get to talk about these crazy <laughs> nominations for uh, the next Serum Visions project. Arriving in the nick of time to try and get away for that and chase our belief into something less resur resurgent. Less resurgent, yeah. We, we need some uh, shrinking belief. Ugh. I'm all about the shrinkage. <laughs> <laughs> so... You all know the drill. We have 14 cards on the ballot for next month's project. These are all nominated by members of the Faithless family. Um, that's one of the perks you can get by joining our Patreon. And if you want to vote on these cards after we go through them, we will open up the voting for about a week or so. All patrons can cast votes, so go ahead and check out patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. You'll also get access to our wonderful Discord community where people are always throwing around crazy decks, ideas, etc. So what do you guys think? Should we just dive in? Yes, sir. Hell yeah. All right, Arun, you're up first. All right. Number one, aggressive mining. Three red uh, enchantment. We've seen this one before, actually. <laughs> you can't play lands. Static ability, not great for sure. Not ideal. Sacrifice a land. Draw two cards. Pretty sweet. Activate this ability only once each turn. Uh, once again, not ideal. And this was nominated by John, who writes, Seems like this should be breakable. I've been trying very hard, but it keeps sucking. I would love to see someone try to take a crack at it besides me. Pioneer or with all the free spells in modern. Thanks. I know there was a Saffron Olive deck with this at some point. I remember watching it, although I, I have to assume that it was not particularly successful. I mean, this thing has two really bad drawbacks, you know? I think it's what it comes down to. Like, maybe if you could still play lands, or if you could use this ability more than once, it could be interesting. I don't even know why is it... Only use yeah. once a turn, you know, four mana, sack your lands, draw eight cards. That seems fine, you know? Yeah, that that is such a kick in the teeth. Like, this isn't even from the current era of we're not allowed to do anything more than once a turn ever. You're just not just, just yeah, that's no, true. no shenanigans. We're in the no shenanigans uh, period for Magic the Gathering. Remember how Magic the Gathering is a game about deck building and interesting combinations and finding crazy synergies? Not anymore. Once per turn. Once per turn, that's it. Yep. But in the original way. Right. I don't know. Like, I have never seen this card before, b besides people randomly complaining about it. And mm. I have never seen it on the stack, like, not in my lifetime. So, as Arun said, this has been nominated in a previous edition. It's been a couple of years, actually. Damn. <laughs> I decided to actually try it out. It didn't win the vote, but in the Community League, you know, I wanted to at least... Give this a shot. And the card is sweet, but holy crap, that drawback sucks. You cannot play lands is so punishing. <laughs> what it comes down to is lands are so good hmm. in the current era of magic, right? Like you never run out of gas, right? So you just have to keep playing lands. Lands are so powerful. Mm. The second drawback is that it costs four mana. Mm. Like that's just too much. Like I think if this costs two, maybe we could like convince ourselves that you cast it and then start trading your lands for mm -hmm, you know, you cast mm -hmm, furies mm -hmm. and solitudes or whatever it's not totally crazy to have this combination of drawbacks and abilities right you can't play lands but you can sack lands to draw potentially four cards per turn cycle once your turn once their turn that's so sweet all right and there's plenty of stuff you could do right there's arboreal grazer there's what's that card you liked more the new one um soul of wind grace Soul of Windgrace, yeah, exactly. Like, there's a bunch of stuff like that that you could play Splendid Reclamation if you wanted to. I look at aggressive mining right. and my mind just goes to all these places, but I just I know in my heart of hearts that it's not going to win. Like, I'm not going to win. The game. <laughs> my mind goes to all these places and all these places suck. Right. So, I mean, worth pointing out, we're we're mentioning a bunch of things that put lands into play. You're still allowed to have lands enter the battlefield on your side. It's not some crazy thing that's like, if a land would enter the battlefield on your side, it just doesn't instead. No, it's not like that. So you can cheat this card, and it's tempting to want to do so, but as you're saying, at a cost of four, it's just not feasible. Yeah, and then like most of the cards you draw will be lands, right? So you have to do something with them, and like now, okay, now I've got Seismic Assaults. Son of Green Day does double duty, right? It gives you both a discard outlet for your lands you draw, and lets you more lands. Like, it works both ways. It does. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I like Soul of Wind Grace. I felt like it had Primeval Titan energy when we were talking about the 
preview week, it, it did 5-0. I think Aspiring Spike just threw a couple into like a John Saga Van deck, yeah. and he said it was pretty good. So yeah, I mean, the power is there on Solar Wind Grace, but can you afford to pay four mana for this aggressive mining enchantment? I think four is too much. I think that's the biggest problem. Yeah, if this was mm. three, this would be a whole other conversation, I think. There's um, there's a card that gives all your lands cycling for like one red, and I think it costs two, and also has cycling. Yeah, the one from MH. Yeah. If this had been costed something like that, I think it would be totally feasible. And it just it just isn't. And that's I mean, I think that's kind of the end of the story for it, is just they did just they did not cost this thing to be played in uh post MH modern. Or if it's kind of like a shutdown board in the same way like experimental frenzy does where you can just sacrifice it or like blink it or something on its own. Yeah. So the failsafe wasn't as terrible as it is. Right, although that's not super fun. All right, next card up. Next yeah. card up. <laughs> Zach, what's next? Well, what do we got here? We got our boy Spreading Algae. So this is um, from Ben Horseman, and it's a single green mana, so CMC1, sorry, uh, mana value one. Uh, enchant land. <laughs> spreading Algae can enchant only a swamp. When enchanted land becomes tapped, destroy that land. When spreading algae is put into a graveyard from play, return it to its owner's hand. So Radix writes, Urborg plus uh, spreading algae equals one mana repeatable land destruction? So let's just be clear on that. Um, That's if they tap it. If they tap it, the land gets destroyed. They also get the mana that turn. So spreading algae plus Urborg means that you can lock one of their lands down every turn. Um, and by lock down, it's like if they use it, they get stone rained. Yes. I... Yeah, th- this is definitely a thing you can do. And uh, I invite uh, Dylan MTG to hop in here and do that. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on this guy? Yo, the new Rishidon Port Merfolk is the only thing that comes to my mind. Now we, you know, it's sure it's a three card combo that destroys one land a turn for like <laughs> three mana, but you know, it works technically. So what was the combo? So you have an Orborg in play. You yes. also have a Rishidon Cutthroat Okay, so we're all thinking about the Dog Hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, Rishidon Dog Hand. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a way to repeatedly twiddle, you can use this as one, as, as a Stone Rain per turn. Okay. Is there any place for kind of twiddles like the Ralsarex and the Damishos? There has to be one that just twiddles. I think there might be a Kiora or a Teferi? Five mana te, five mana Tamiyo, the blue yeah, one. There you go. Mono blue Tamiyo. Four mana Ralsarex, the coin ones, twiddles one, one of your stuff and one of your opponents. Mm. Right. So I think that is the biggest challenge. I do want to first say. The combo is sweet. Urborg plus Spreading Algae is so, so sweet. However, that in itself is just a Stone Rain. If you want to make it happen more than once, now you're adding all these tap effects, and there just aren't very many. So I think that would be the challenge, right? If this is the card that the people choose, <laughs> we're going to be going through Scryfall looking for anything that taps a land. Like Fire Ice, that taps a land, but then they sack the land in response, so like you don't actually get your card draw. I mean, it, you can do it. No, no, you, you would still yeah. get the card draw from Fire Ice because it taps it on resolution. But they, well, as soon as you target their land, they would just tap it instead, and then it would die from the spreading algae. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. But on the bright side, if we were playing green and then blue and then red, but it's one color away from adding Omnath. <laughs> you know, the other thing you can do with spreading algae is just forget about land destruction. This is just a, a ranker like enchantment that just comes back to your hand whenever it dies, right? Mm. So yeah. if you have something that just eats enchantments and you just want a bunch hey. of that effect, a bunch of rankers, you can have. I mean, it's actually a safer card than ranker to just enchant your own swamp and then feed it to an Oratog or whatever. Enigmatic incarnation with a one drop every turn. It's just the enigmatic, the swamp, and the algae. Exactly. Okay, I mean, that's something. So, interesting card. Maybe we need a touch too much work for not enough payoff. And what about the next one, which I think might be right up your alley, she... Uh, oh, yeah. So, this is the classic Lotleth Troll. Uh, black green, creature zombie troll. 2 1, trample. A lot of text. Discard a creature card, put a plus one plus one counter on it, and pay a back black to regenerate. This was nominated by Briger, or Brigger, who says. Have you ever seen a card that does it all? 
cheap CMC, protection, evasion, and the ability to grow and change cards from one zone to another for free, this card does it all. And it is not constrained by a certain strategy. You can do loops with Master of Death for your modern fans, and it can be taken in a bevy of ways in Pioneer with stuff like Hollow One, Feasting Troll King, and Bartered Cow. Uh, yeah, you know, I believe Lotleth Troll was in the the first Mugak decks that kind of appeared, the first Black Green Asmo food of yeah. Troll King decks once Modern Horizons 2 came out. And then uh, Lotleth Troll was also played in a lot of the Hogak decks, like when during Hogak Winter. Mm. Uh, so there, this card for sure has seen modern has some modern pedigree. Uh, you know the question is, what could we do with it that's more unique than just you know re- trying to recreate Hogak, or cre- adding it to these decks that kind of already exist in modern? Yeah, I I I, I definitely think that there's more potential in this. Just being a, a bit of a medium role player that fits in to a lot of different strategies and a lot of different goofy stuff. Yeah, so we have stuff like Mugak. We have I really think the biggest shining for Lola Troll has historically be Soul Flayer. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for Pioneer, that was definitely the, the number one home. No, no, I was saying in Modern as well. Oh, really? Yeah, that's right. There was that little period where there was that, like, one person who played an absolute ton of Soul Flayer. And yeah. I think they were, like, top 32 in challenges. Yeah. And <laughs> I was just playing just Soul Flayer, a full place of Lola Troll as their most consistent enabler. Right. Yeah, that was wild. I thank you for reminding me that that ever existed. <laughs> that moment you just sometimes block it out of your mind and all of a sudden, mm-hmm. wait, the Soul Flayer player, the Flayer player. Uh, yeah, it's recently upgraded to uncommon in two x two. Maybe it's time for us to pick it up a bit. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely a quality role player for all kinds of strategies. Yes, always down to venge find some homies for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming up next, we've got definitely a fan favorite and speaks to a strategy that is a favorite of fans. Uh, it's Ingenious Infiltrator from Ignacio E. Uh, Mord, can you take us through this Vidalcan Ninja? So we have Ingenious Infiltrator. Four mana, two, three. Whenever a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card, but it has Ninjutsu for a blue and a black. So likely one of the best ninjas we have ever seen, a two mana Ninjutsu, much better than ninjas, the deep powers, if you can pay the black, you should not only the extra point of toughness, but also the fact you draw for each ninja that connects. So a lot of the time, these plus the 1-1 one, one black changeling that's unblockable, this one should draw you a lot of cards. And these things stack, if you have two of them, you get yeah. to draw four cards. Ignacio has actually made me lose so many digs while playing ninjas. We'll get a bunch of 3 to even trying to find the best way to actually get the creatures on the ground. Griflas and Dying Malice. We have been scamming before it was cool with ninjas. <laughs> so Ignacio says, listen, you like ninjas? I like ninjas. <laughs> They're arguably the cooler version of samurais, and it's time they have their time in the sun. Or shadows. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say that they're the cooler version of rogues, first of all, because it's in the right tribe, and for some reason, they didn't get a bunch of really, really good flash cards. But we're neither here nor there. Ninjas are sweet. If only we still had access to Oko, Dan. Exactly. <laughs> My God. <laughs> the Ninja 5 featuring Just Oko. give us Oko. Give us Oko and Udo. What's the worst that can happen, right? I mean, in the in Canisters, no ban modern. Like, half the decks were blue-green piles. Yeah. I'm glad that Ignacio put this on the ballot. We, like, had toyed with doing a Ninja Week during Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, and I think we just didn't get around to it. There's even a new Ninja Planeswalker, right? Kaito works really well mm-hmm. with ninjas. Bunch of new ninjas from Neon Dynasty, and we didn't really try them in a dedicated way. Off the top of my head, I, I'm not sure that any of them, like, immediately crack power level, but, I mean, there's plenty of new options since the last time we revisited this concept in, like, MH2 or MH1 or whatever it was. So, yeah, what's not to like? Yeah, not sure if any of them are bastard, but at least some of them are worth taking into consideration. And the Bladeswalker is even making ninjas with the minus two, so... Yeah, between the um, Changeling ninjas and some of the new releases, I think ninjas would be a worthwhile uh, exploration. So uh, I, I actually... A little bit of support on this one for me, just because I, I enjoy the tribe. Oh yeah, sneaky sneaky. All right, Jiggy. You got this next one here. Oh yeah, my favorite. Next card is Arayo Sorotami Ascendant, nominated by yours truly. Uh, one in a blue, 
for a flip creature. Uh, the top half is 1-1 one, one flying. Whenever the fourth spell of a turn is played or cast, flip Arayo. Uh, need to keep in mind the fourth spell. So during anybody's turn and any counts all spells, pretty sickos. So you definitely get a lot of a lot of people with that. Uh, when it's flipped, you get a legendary enchantment. Counter the first spell played by each opponent each turn. Uh, so this is pretty sick because it essentially makes your spells uncounterable on your turn unless they have two counter spells. Uh, and you know, on their turn, they just have to throw a card in the garbage before they can do anything. Uh, so I write, Arayo is a boss who doesn't <laughs> love exclamation marks in the game log. <laughs> now we have an offer you can't refuse to enable a turn one flip, uh, which we didn't have before. It's a new Arayo toy. Before they banned all the fun stuff, there's no real one. There's no real way to flip Arayo turn one, but with Good. an offer you can't refuse. And we should keep it that uh, we way. We can now. No, now. So, you know, so I, <laughs> you know, Arayo sweet. I love Arayo. Uh, I'm going to probably mess around with Arayo anyways. Uh, eventually, when I get t- around to it, you know, if I do it for the podcast, even better. So just to make sure I'm understanding you, you're envisioning a deck full of zero drops, right? So you can play Mishra's Bobble or whatever on turn one counter it with your own offer you can't refuse that's two spells and mm-hmm. you have two treasures you cast arayo now you've got three spells and then what happens you, you have another zero drop yeah another zero drop and boom arayo is flipped on turn one let's go dan exclamation mark <laughs> exclamation <laughs> point arayo yeah. has flipped yeah for real mtgo game log gives you an exclamation point it's pretty sick let me tell you something <laughs> mtg arena may have graphics but we have punctuation I mean, as far as I know, this is the only exclamation point that MTGO gives you. I haven't seen another one. Uh, I know there's more than one, but yeah. I bet probably most flip cards will actually give you the exclamation point. There's nobody, oh. there's no any other cards <laughs> worth flipping. It's just no one is doing the horizontal flipping. No, the one who's graveyard hate. Uh, I love that card. Nizumi Grave Robber. I love that card. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite cube cards of all time. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that one flips. That one hmm. flips. Yo, that card... <laughs> Flips. <laughs> All right, Jiggy, we'll see if you can win the people over for uh, another go at Project Arayo. None of my nominations have succeeded yet, you know. Maybe maybe this one will. But also, maybe it won't. You gotta nominate Possessed Portal. I thought you were gonna bring us the Possessed Portal Yo, where, where are my Possessed Portals at? Because I gotta tell you, right now, as we're recording this podcast, I'm 3060 in a league with Colorless Tron. So I'm just, where are my Colorless Portals at? Yo, next time. I'll nominate it for next month. <laughs> that's what he says now then he will find something insane and really bad and he's gonna try to lure us down that rabbit hole I mean Brothers War is coming out we might get the good goods you know give me give me a new mox that is you know maybe like Amber not quite breakable but also very nice <laughs> Amber power level of mox consider it I want stronger than Amber but that's gonna get banned Amber is like the most acceptable well also I mean let's let's take a brief aside to the world of current events is that Breach is kind of tearing it up right now. So Amber level of Broken might actually be broken. It took a little while, but... Yeah, no. <laughs> you said the world of current events. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, the queen has passed. Oh, no, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Jess Guy Breach is really doing listen, well. Listen, listen, you're, you're, <laughs> Paper and tabletop magic. What, what is your target demographic here? I want, you know what? Let's represent David for a second uh, and say, uh, I don't really think anyone here cares about the queen. I think in a week, nobody's really going to, uh, everyone's going to be done with the memes and we're all going to move on with our lives because at the end of the day, it's really not that important. My favorite British person that has had any comment on it was like, hey, let's go celebrate. So. <laughs> Amen. All right. Our next card is Kemal's Druidic Vow. This is nominated by Lurking Evil. Lurking Evil says, I love brewing and often do it with underpowered cards. This is not the case here, however. I've never played Genesis Wave in Modern, but I think... This card, Kamal Juridic Vow, can make a good impersonation of Genesis Wave and Pioneer. Maybe pair it with Planeswalkers or Oath of Teferi. Okay, so what is Lurking Evil talking about? This is a legendary sorcery from original Dominaria. Legendary sorceries mean you can only cast them if you control a legendary creature or a Planeswalker. So they're like super special effects. Is that actually the case? Well, it's X green green. Look at the top X cards of your library. You may put any number of land and or legendary permanent cards with CMC X or less from among them onto the battlefield. The rest go to the graveyard. 
So just for example, let's assume we're in like mono green with Nissa, Kiora, Karm, whatever. We tap a bunch of mana, we, we play Druidic Vow, X equals six. That's eight mana total. Flip your top six. If they're permanents, they can potentially all come into play as long as they have CMC six or less. So it kind of reminds you a little bit of like Storm the Festival almost. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's a really similar color, right? Like triple green. Yeah. Um, Genesis Wave? Genesis, Genesis wave. wave. Yeah. But it's not restricted to legendary. Exactly. For for an extra mana, you get the non-restriction with legendaries, I think. It also isn't a legendary sorcery, so you don't need to control a legendary exactly. creature or planeswalker. But that said, we're getting a sweet, sweet discount here by following that rule, and uh, that has value? It's only a one mana discount is the real issue, honestly. And then, you know, you have to fill your deck up with legends. And the other thing with legends is that they're bad. You can hit two of the same legends and they're going to die to the legend rule. So it comes right. with its own set of... <laughs> Sowed the seeds of its own destruction. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like kind of anti-synergizes with itself. And it's only one mana away from Genesis Wave, which is, you know, how much is one mana when you're paying green, green X? Yeah, it just feels like they were a little bit way too conservative when they design this. Um, but, I mean, I guess for obvious reasons. I don't know when the last time something like um, Genesis Wave was really busted is. Well, I know that Lurking Evil brews primarily in Pioneer. Genesis Wave is not legal there. <laughs> and we do actually have like a right. big mana green strategy in Pioneer mm. that plays a lot of legends. So it's not that far off. Yeah. That's fair. Very fair. Oath of Nyssa, unbanned now in Pioneer. So there's plenty of stuff that this can actually get. Anything that is in the Legends Matter space is like forward compatible. There's always going to get better. There's hundreds of new Legends every single year. So we should keep our eye on these cards. But I, I kind of agree with you guys that this doesn't feel quite powerful enough. It's the one that's Nick's seen. Like with the Oath of Nisa, we're just waiting for one or two amazing monogreen legendaries or such. And you're like, eventually you just get distracted and this Nick's into a deck list. <laughs> right. Yeah, a good point about Pioneer. All right, our next card here comes with a song. So we, we got to throw this one to Zach. All right, we got uh, <laughs> the Brews Go Marching One by One, hurrah, hurrah. The Brews Go Marching One by One, hurrah, hurrah. The Brews Go Marching it, One Zach. by One, the Put some Brews life Donate into it. Ticks, Put some Opponents Have Fun. Listen, man, I'm in a coffee shop. I'm not I'm not singing out loud. If, 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 oh, if, come <laughs> on. Listen, the I promise you, one I by promise. One. Hurrah, okay, yeah, thank you. Hurrah, hurrah. The Brews Go Marching One by One, hurrah. I love this dirge. Hurrah. It's my favorite the dirge. The Brews Go Marching One by One, the Brews Donate Ticks, Opponents Have Fun, and they all go marching down to four, go marching down to four. <laughs> <laughs> Time to drop on Bruce some more Bruce some Bruce some Bruce. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you for helping me out. Thank you, on thank that. you, thank you. Someone had to do it. So we've got March of Burgeoning Life. So this is X and a green instant. As an additional cost to cast the spell, you may exile any number of green cards in your hand. The spell costs two less to cast for each card exiled this way. Essentially, you add two to the X. For each card exiled this way and what do we get with this x choose target creature with mana value less than x less than x search your library for a creature card with the same name as that creature and put it onto the battlefield tapped then shuffle this is really really complicated to understand but let's uh pick a creature that i'd actually want to do this to let's say eternal witness i would have to pay a total of five mana yes x must be four then you subtract one that the mana cost of uh Eternal Witness is, is three, uh, and then you add on the green. So a total of five mana to copy a three drop, and you get to search your library for that copy, put it into play, tapped, and then shuffle. I, Mord, you're the toolbox master, but the fact that it has to be the same name, obviously, kind of... It's like anti-toolboxy. Right, like, it, it's like... Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I'm waiting. What else did Kilgore Trout write about this? Oh, yes, sorry. So we, we had a song, but we also had... Uh... Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, no. no. So that, that's Dan's notes. Whoops. Yeah, he cast the song. He's selling it with a song. Right, right. And But I would say that Dan's comment is that each time uh, Jason Kilgore Trout submits a card, we think, well, it can't be more zany than this. Uh, and then uh, he, he manages to do it. He's, uh, he's a mad lad. And his brief pitch. His pitch get better and his recommendations get worse. <laughs> it's, it's like an opposite correlation. 
Right. We have right. the worst possible march. I think this is one of the few scenarios where I can go ahead and say this is strictly worse than a Adam Riskol. Mm-hmm. Which so this is immediately both to pioneer contention because this is like what happens if we make a Adam Riskol super bad. Right. Yeah, March to Burgeoning Life really messes with your head because it kind of reads like a tutor, but then you, you can't tutor. He actually just duplicates the creature you already have in play, which is not the same thing as tutoring at all. It's not even close. The right? more you read it, the worse it becomes. Yep. The creature comes into play tapped. It's plus two mana off the CMC. You're targeting your own creature, most likely, unless it's a mirror match. <laughs> so that means like you're just opening yourself up to a two for one. Where's the upside? I mean, the only upside is this pitch clause reducing the cost by two for every green card you pitch, but uh, I just don't see it. I think the only way I can see this happen is like in a sort of neoform build where you can get something into play that you would like to keep. Like, I don't know, you manage to, for some reason, really cheaply get in like a Hullbreaker Horror, and then you pitch three cards in your hand to get it permanently for three mana, you know? But you already have it permanently. <laughs> I need I need it's David around to tell me if this works in any of the pioneer decks that are trying to do like the dual caster mage combo. It's not legal though. I mean, dual caster is not legal. No, no, no. I know that that card isn't, but that combo exists in some form, right? There's there's some. No, they are, it only. Ex- I think it only exists in Vanifar form. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I think no, it's not Vanifar. It's uh, there's some other way where you get like. You get a copy and then you get a... It's like Nabon something. Narumeha, Master Wizard. Oh, Narumeha. Plus Seeger, <laughs> Stormcaller. But it's... I mean, there's... March of Burgeoning Life does not help with that. No? Like, all, all it right. does is copy a creature you already have. So it's, it's, not a, yeah. it's not a tutor. That's the thing. So I don't know. I mean, I trust Kilgore Trout. Like, he has his finger on the pulse of what the Brewers want. I think his cards have won more votes than anyone else by a large margin. <laughs> I hope this one doesn't win, though. You know what? <laughs> you just said the curse thing, saying, I hope this ge- I hope this one doesn't win. It's just asking to lose. Right. <laughs> that, that's just asking for people to vote for it. Also, the only reason I knew the melody of the song by that people tried to add it is because of the movie Ants. Mm. <laughs> Good movie. Oh, yeah. When they go marching to war with the termites. Really um, dark. Way darker than you than you remember. Yeah, I gotta rewatch that one. I had to rewatch it because Dan Danu is so much darker than a movie for kids oh, should be. Yeah, it's it's something else. It's like shockingly dark for yeah. no reason whatsoever. Uh, because they didn't want it to be compared to a Bug's Life, which was coming out at the same time. <laughs> this is like a gritty Bug's Life. Right, it was, it was a gritty, realistic Bug's Life for the for this uh, for this generation. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Kilgore Trout, for the song. <laughs> thank you, Mord, for the beautiful rendition. Zach, you owe us a proper rendition you'll, you'll when you're it. not in you'll a coffee shop. I just, <laughs> I just don't want it to make other people uncomfortable with this crazy guy singing in the corner. You want to be the, the cool guy podcasting right. in, in the coffee hey, listen, shop. Hey, you know? listen. You got <laughs> to do, you you do, do what you got to do. <laughs> the cool guy podcasting yeah. in the coffee shop. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for the people. I'm here for the people, baby. All right, Arun, tell us about... Uh, Joda the Unifier. Oh yeah, yeah, this is actually kind of exciting. I read the some of the original magic books way back when, like Ice Age, The Dark, etc. And I believe Joda was the main character in those, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, hmm. So this is kind of cool to see him finally get some fame again. So Joda the Unifier, Wooberg CMC, legendary creature, human wizard. <laughs> Damn, so much text. Legendary creatures you control get plus X plus X, where X is the number of legendary creatures you control. So coat of arms for legendary creatures. Whenever you cast a legendary spell from your hand, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a legendary non-land card with lesser mana value. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost, uh, and then risk on bottom. So pretty much legendary creatures, no, all legendary spells you cast have cascade into other legendary spells. So this is a 5 mana 6 6 on basis, right? Because it self pumps. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, which is... Yeah, so Darshik, nominated by my man Darshik, who I still need to meet. Uh, he is in Boston also. Gotta find time to meet up with him. With the new five-color land, pioneer five-color legendary humans, or wizards, <laughs> classic Darshik, has a very clean mana base. Joda, which is one other legendary, plus two anthem, and always at least a 6-6, six, six, could be a solid curve topper in a slower but more resilient humans list, or be a part of a spicy legendary sorcery shell. 
Um, yeah, you know, this card is for sure pretty sick. I have no idea what I'd do with it. Someone, little comment here that says Jota into Niv allows you to tutor for any one of legendary that you're playing as long as it's the only one in your deck. Uh, but I might argue that Niv into Niv draws eight cards and probably just wins the game. <laughs> Maybe. Just because you're right doesn't make you correct. Right. <laughs> you're right, it is not. Yo, this and Niv, you have like, you know, that makes Niv an 8-8 Niv an eight, eight flying, right? That's pretty sick. Mm-hmm. You are not wrong. I did not realize this had an anthem effect. Like this, I feel like I'm reading this card for the first time. Like I know that we looked at it during previews, but it was just so much text that I didn't actually attempt to understand it. No, can we can we just like back up on the fact that this is a six six? Like they did the weird thing with the text that they I thought they swore off doing this ever again. Like he affects himself, and he is a legendary creature, so it's a five minute yeah. six six. But it's written as a five five. Like. I, I thought they made a promise that they were never going to do stuff like this ever again, which I don't care about. I'm an old school magic player. Like, read the card, figure it out. But uh, it's just such a, it's so weird. God. Ah. As I'm reading it now, I'm like, wow, Joda the Unifier is stupidly powerful. Mm. What the heck? <laughs> you cascade for legends. But of course, you have to tap out for it, and then you have to like untap with Joda. And... That's not actually powerful. But if you get to untap, I do agree with the take by Darshik that you really need the anthem part to be relevant in order for it to be good. Like, if you just play this and your creatures get plus three, plus three, because you have weird stuff flying around, I get a lot more interested all of a sudden. Yeah, I think the legendary humans makes total sense. I think Darshik is exactly right. I, I did see someone playing this in Pioneer uh, last week. Um, Wild. They just like had secluded courtyards, unclaimed territories. Like you can do this now. You can get a pretty clean yeah. five color <laughs> tribal mana base. And Jota will get better over time. So the turn to Talia, turn five Yoda curve. Wow. So we have turn one, <laughs> turn one the Green Lady, turn two Talia, turn three Kudro, turn four. Who is a human that costs four and is legendary? Uh, Rick the uh <laughs> Rick. <laughs> Turn for a week. <laughs> turn five Yoda. That's it. He's unifying the magic real, the, the magic beyond, bringing Rick into the metaverse. I'm, I'm sorry. Did I miss something? Is there now a Rick and Morty yeah. secret lair thing? No, no, beyond? not Rick and Morty. Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Oh, Rick. The Walking Dead. Rick. Sorry. There's a much more famous Rick. So good, good, good choice there. <laughs> well done, branding department. All right, so that is Joda the Unifier. Our next card is Mechanized Production. Two blue-blue enchantment aura. Enchant artifact you control. Hmm. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of enchanted artifact. Then, if you control eight or more artifacts with the same name as one another, you win the game. Nominated for us by Epoch Ali who says, I think any card that says win the game has an optimal build to do so. Intriguing proposition. It just so happens that mechanized production involves casting or creating lots of artifacts. Could pair this with something like the time sieve shell, but there's maybe other possibilities. Let's see what Dr. Combo and Brian can churn out. Also, Mord, please do not back this horse. We all know how that goes. Frowny face emoji. <laughs> <laughs> frowny. Really? <laughs> Reading the frowny face emoji as frowny face emoji <laughs> is such a boomer energy, I just cannot fight it. I'm sorry, do you, do you have a better way to do it? Yeah, no, I'm I'm team Dan right now, you definitely gotta read it out. <laughs> yeah, sad you, you... face! You just said sad face or sad smiley. Frowny face emoji is like the boomerest, most boomering boomer way to read it. Out. That is an emoji, not an emoticon. Let's let's be very accurate I, about this. There is a difference, I'm and I'm not him. surprised that Moore doesn't not, know it. I'm not fighting the exactitude of Dan's words. Uh -huh. No, you. I'm well, just maybe adding. You <laughs> I, I'm just adding to the fact of what Dan said that the only displays the fact that he's a boomer. <laughs> Uh huh. No, That's I it. uh, I I hear I hear all the words you're saying, and I'm glad that you uh feel that you're being heard. <laughs> Fuck, <laughs> screw you. When I first got my cell phone, we didn't have emoticons. We had you you had to do this. You didn't get to put a smiley. You didn't get to put an right. emoticon. You just we, had to do we, the we colon had, You had to learn the emojis, and there was a clown one that nobody used or understood. Then there wasn't. Yeah, then, then there also, wasn't. <laughs> 
<laughs> If people don't understand it, it doesn't exist. Uh, so. All right, so, um, so, so, uh, real aside. Make an ace production. I actually have a history with this card, uh, not for myself, um, but there was someone at my local shop. So shout out to CJ Tomlin, uh, lantern pilot aficionado, and a wonderful human being. And he actually used this as an alternate win condition in lantern control for a while when people were like loading up on Emrakuls, the reshuffle uh, titans, in order to huh. uh, have a chance against lantern control when it was. This was when Mox, uh, the Mox was legal. Yeah, when Salvato won with Lantern, when the deck was good for a few days. Yeah, when when the deck was actually like legit. Um, so just there, there. I I have seen this be successful, uh, specifically in a Lantern control build, and I'm super excited for this one to win. Uh, if I glance down, okay. I would be surprised if I found anything on this list that I was more excited about. In fact, just glancing through the rest of the cards, we're gonna mention this. This is my back. I love this. I'm in for this. Let's let's go. I love the flavor text. And I just think about, give, give me eight walkers, I will give you the city by doing ban. And I just think mm. of eight tiny academy manufacturers right. just piling over the city with over a million food. Wait, but that's the, so like, this counts food tokens, right? If you have eight food yeah. tokens, yep. you win the game. Yep. yep. That's, uh, yep. at the time, I can't remember what he was enchanting. I think it was Codex Shredders, because that makes sense in that deck, like strategically. Yeah, because you just get more, um, more control milling, over the draws. Like one. Yeah, so exactly. It so it's like a plan B. Right. Sud suddenly, there's no way that they're ever going to be able to dig out. Like they have to draw like seven answers in a row. And if your opponent tries to get rid of it, it's like the least relevant card because it's the one you have the most copies of. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah, I mean, it makes. If I was gonna do this, you know, I think feel like I just go for the. I'd try and put snap that on and on an on a academy manufacturer and go for the eight food tokens. Eight food, eight clues, eight treasures, as your heart desires. I got the turn three kill today with Academy Manufacturer and it was beautiful. <laughs> I do that sometimes. <laughs> Stunning. All I needed was my mill opponent to mill me some cats. Assisting the good old way. Well, uh, Mechanized Production has my backing. I don't know exactly what we do with it, but I would definitely play at least one thing of Lantern Control and then anything that uses a bunch of token artifacts is the really easy way to win it now that it didn't have back then hell yeah yeah it's a cool nomination i kind of forgot about this one i feel like as an alternate win condition it's actually like worse and harder to pull off than battle of wits mm. if i can just throw that out there like they both win on the next upkeep right. which is already pretty bad this one is vulnerable to a two for one in a way that battle of wits is not the fail case <laughs> it actually functions battle of wits if you are in the fail well... case it doesn't function I mean, we're talking about the non-existent downside of playing four times the recommended deck size. No, but what I mean is, if you don't, if you don't have over two hundred cards, and then you play a battle of wits, it sure. does literally nothing. Yeah, um, I mean, it pitches to force. I said play. <laughs> I said play, but all right. The point that that I want to make is that winning on your next upkeep is actually quite bad. Yeah, I understand that. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay <laughs> like, or rather I mean Battle of Wits if it won immediately would actually be quite good so mechanized production it's cool I mean the fact that it generates additional value if it's just in play and now that we have food tokens Underworld Cookbook Saga just double up triple up oh uh, double up oh uh, oh uh. oh uh, oh uh, level up triple up oh oh <laughs> <laughs> Mord you have no idea what I was referencing there do you no of course not okay got it Okay, cool. Glad, glad that um, Sir Mix-a-Lot has survived to the next generation. All right, Arun. <laughs> Arun, <laughs> what have we got next? All right. Bayou Graf, one in a green. Plant dog, creature. As an additional cost to cast the spell, sacrifice a creature or pay three, and it's a 5-4. So one in the green for a 5-4, additional cost, uh, pay three mana or sack a creature. So Aramisor, aka Fairy Vandal, writes, A vanilla 5 4 for 2 has to break some rules somewhere, right? I've been trying to slot this into a Jun strategy in Explorer and it's been working decently well, but the card has some glaring weaknesses, such as like the lack of evasion, removal resistance, <laughs> really anything other than being a very big dog that comes down turn 2. It's a quick, powerful dog. Um... I mean, best I can best I can do is turn one Ornithopter Springleaf Drum, turn two 
Biograph, sack the ornithopter, and you have a stubborn denial in your hand. And you can then <laughs> tap the graph with the spring leaf drum. You're going super deep. I'm going for something much simpler, like turn one neo form, turn two growth, or neo form for my six five growth and keep a two two and dying wolf. Oh, so just like don't cast it. You're saying just just cheat it in the play. Oh, or cast it because I'm sacrificing young wolf or like the old neo form builds with rallyer that just try to play an aggressive game because if you just sacrifice one of the undying of your twelve undying dudes, you just get a bigger undying dude than a five four. That's so interesting. I mean, there's like the vanilla aspect of it, right? It's a huge plant dog, huge creature. Then there's also like the sacrifice outlet, and I, I'm kind of drawn to that, right? Like, you can get a vanilla creature anywhere. You can get a Tarmogoyf if you want that, but like, you know, that's not that interesting. What about like Tarmogoyf <laughs> that also was a sacrifice outlet? You know, I'm going to eat my unlucky witness with the Biograph. Or maybe I want like a five power creature for some other reason. Like, I, Stubborn Denial makes sense. What if I'm playing like a fight rigging deck? Like, the synergies are broader than just combat stats, <laughs> if I can put it that way. We just have to, like, find something. Yeah. But it is a weak card. <laughs> Let me just <laughs> throw that out there. Listen, Dan, you can get a 5-4 anywhere, okay? People come to Faithless Brewing for the flair and the fun, all right? Exactly. Yeah. For the atmosphere and the attitude, I think Thank that's you, what the, we're uh, here that, for that, the, uh, the plant dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're here for the kittens. Let's be absolutely 100% clear about this. We're all here for the kittens. Yeah. And the kittens are here Where's for us. Where's the plant kitten, Mord? Wow, that's five kittens for sure. That's four kittens. No, four. Those are so cute. Oh my gosh. Is that the mama over there? Yeah. So somebody asked me, where can we see these kittens? And if you tune in to twitch.tv slash Mord to Light, that's Emmy's Twitch channel. When he streams, he has a kitten cam up. So go bookmark that. Don't wait. They're so cute right now. They're so small. They're so cute. And of course, Eris, their mom, is just always circling. It's so, oh my gosh. Hello. <laughs> they're yeah, so they're cute. tiny. They're cute. All right. Uh, where were we? <laughs> Biograph, plant dogs, not as cute as kittens. Zach, what's our next card? All right, so uh, after the whelmingness that was uh, just a big fatty, uh, we've got Shepherd of the Flock slash Usher to safety. So this is an adventure creature. It's one and a white for a 3-1 Shepherd of the Flock, human peasant. Uh, it has no ability text, um, but it has an adventure uh, ability, spell, card, half. Uh, Usher to safety is a single white mana instant adventure. Return target permanent you control to its owner's hand. So you can play the Usher to safety half for a single white, and then you get a 3-1 uh, body attached to this. Judge Rob writes, this is a marginal body and an okay adventure. It does a surprising amount of work as a utility card. It's not going to headline the deck it's in, but I want to see this hold together an interesting deck as support card that holds things together. Uh, yeah, that, that seems to be a pretty reasonable assessment of what, what this is. I don't know exactly what I want to do with it, but I'm glad that we have the expertise of someone like Mord to Light here um, to, to guide us. I just realized this works as additional copies of Quartz Sky Fisher if I'm playing Monument of Oketra. Mm. Like it's a 2 mana mm. 3 one that bounces something with its full CTV. I mean, the thing that's kind of interesting about this is that normally, you know, like these. I mean, like, you know, when you vapor snag your own creature to save it, whatever, that's card disadvantage. But this kind of turns that on its head, because even though you, you get that effect, but you still get a 3-1 out of it. You know, like, 3-1's not that great, but it is, you know, this effect is kind of nifty, and this is a way to not go down on yeah. cards when you save your own thing. Yeah, Shutdown of the Skulls is probably the best use for Shepherd of the Flock. That's, that's where I did see a little bit of play in Standard. We've messed with that interaction in Pioneer. David is constantly sending me lists that have Shepherd of the Flock in them. Because it's actually kind of hard to find spells or effects that target your own permanence, right? And especially if you're trying to do something weird, like um, like if you have Orvar, David loves Orvar. <laughs> Orvar will copy whatever you target. <laughs> the all form? So yeah, Orvar the all form. Where am I going to find a card that can like target my own Showdown of the Skulls to give me a copy of Showdown of the Skulls? Well, Shepherd of the Flock is your answer. So it, it tends to be the answer to like weird questions. And for that reason, I think it's like a really cool role player and uh, you got to give props to Judge Rob for nominating it. I think this would lead to like a few vastly different directions, but yeah, it's actually a pretty unique effect. 
if we end up playing this, I'm 100% just slamming this in a monument of Oketra and then in a shoulder of the skulls so like I'm just letting everybody know. I'm just getting back my value. We have been made aware. Orvar is good now with Liliana's and Pioneers. <laughs> <laughs> Spicy. The Jeskai Orvar showdown deck. I mean, this is your chance. It's time. So, unfortunately, I have some prior commitments uh, here in the port of New Orleans, so I'm not going to be able to finish out this list. Looking down these cards, uh, I know that my wonderful co-hosts are going to do a great job talking them up. There is a repeat nominee that I'm excited to uh, see some votes get cast for, so uh, I will definitely be backing that one. I hope you guys uh, understand where I'm going with that and uh, will talk it up for me. But thank you so much for having me around, Jiggy, uh, Mord, and Dan. And uh, excited to see who gets nominated and uh, to what extent we get to brew with crazy cards. Oh, yeah. See you in Vegas, friend. Yeah, absolutely. Super excited about that. And uh, it's going to be a fun time. All right. Safe travel, Zach. Bon voyage. Bye. Bye, Zach. Love you, bud. All right, we got three more cards left to go, and we might as well jump down to the one that Zach is alluding to here. Returning to the ballot for the second month in a row, third time overall, I think, is Necrotic Ooze. Necrotic Ooze. Two black black for a 4-3 creature ooze. As long as Necrotic Ooze is on the battlefield, it has all activated abilities of all creature cards in all graveyards. So what does that mean? 4 mana for a 4-3 is nothing special, but 4 mana for a 4-3 that has, like, Gristlebrand text, or that has Devoted Druid <laughs> text, is actually kind of interesting. And one of the ways that the Necrotic Ooze, like, tends to be built is so that as soon as you cast it, you win the game immediately, because yeah. you have enough stuff in your graveyard that, you know, you make infinite mana, you give it haste or something, who, who knows what it is. Super cool effect, and pretty unique. There's only one other creature that's even similar, and that's Patchwork Crawler. Um, which is two mana for like a one-two zombie. You have to pay mana to exile it, but it has a very similar game text. Yeah, um, first the Gator even goes ahead and says, I'm renovating Goose for two reasons. First, despite only being illegal in modern, I realize you can still brew with this, with this card in Pioneer via fake news, also known as Patchwork Crawler, because it's like Necrotic Goose at home, right? Quite clearly. <laughs> Second, and most important... <laughs> Only after the last vote did Brewmaster David reveal Ooze is one of his favorite cards, and this might be the only way to bring David out of his sales imposed brewing retirement from the modern format. David's Pioneer Brews are great, but sometimes hearing them feels like watching Michael Jordan hit home runs in the minor leagues when you know he could be doing a 360 slam dunk in Madison Square Garden. What will he brew in modern with Ooze? You know what will be some wild masterpieces like Ooze plus Vito plus Bellidos Witherbloom plus Children of Corlys. And yeah, Mord, uh, this is probably before your time, but Michael Jordan I, was a I, basketball player. I, I saw the Looney Tunes movie. I saw Space Sham. Okay? I got all the context I needed from Space Sham. No, no, I saw the... No, I saw... I saw the correct Space Sham movie. The disrespect on my issue has gone too far when I get attacked for the new Space Sham movie. <laughs> Well, thank you, First Turnigator, for that image. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, David's exiled himself from the modern format, but for good reason. And Pioneer is a place for brewers. But yeah, I, mean, I think Necrotic Ooze could be the card to bring him back. I know he's got a backlog of, of Ooze <laughs> decks from years past, and I don't know. I mean, so this combo here with, what is it? Vito, Belladros, Witherbroom, Children of Corliss. My head can't compute that right now, but I assume that wins. I don't know if it wins, but it has to do something. It should win. Well, you don't want to sack your ooze unless you really have to. I mean, that's the interesting thing. So, you, hmm. like, you do want effects that don't require tapping, and I think that Belladros does that. Uh, it only gets activated abilities, so I don't think it gets Vito's static text. You need to have Vito still in play. Yeah. Huh. I, I'm not sure this was, like, a correct proposal. It was just a mind-blowing theory of what David can do if he returns from exile. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be down. If this card gets voted, I'd be down to make some wild brews, for sure. <laughs> also, the art is, like, pretty whack, honestly. It's pretty grim and graphic. It's an ooze just devouring everything as it should. To death, all my skull, and so in death lies ultimate power. Geth, Lord of the Vault. Maybe Geth will... Is Geth dead? Do we know? Is he gonna pop back up? Oh, I have zero idea about Geth. 
Hmm. All right, Ooze finished, I think, top five last time around. Let's see if it can crack the top spots this month. But there's two more competitors it'll have to contend with. So Arun, tell us about Danatha Benalia's Hope. Yeah, so this is four and a white for a 4-4. Vegetary creature, human knight, good types. First strike, vigilance, life link. Uh, would be great for soul flayer. When Danatha Benalia's <laughs> Hope enters the battlefield, you may put an aura or equipment card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield attached to Danatha. Uh, didn't Spike have some gifts on given deck with like this blue, white, green with this band angel thing that did something similar? Yeah, they want the tutor, I remember. Uh, nominated by Tombo Catcher, who writes, There's lots of good equipment out there. Rabbit battery, ember cleave, any living weapon. Danatha hasn't seen any plain pioneer yet, but I'm sure she can help us build a better equipment or ours deck, maybe even in modern. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. It does handle graveyard. I guess that's pretty unique. Yes. David mentions mon like hammer time in pioneer. That's not quite there yet. You know, this could be a five mana piece, but you know, five mana fourteen fourteen is a five mana fourteen fourteen. So I think you. You have to try and go for equipment, something like the Hentu Marmor that whenever he attacks, he starts to get permanent or stuff. Because if you go for enchantments, you would rather just play Storm Herald. So th this has to make you look at the, uh, the artifact side, not trying to just cheat um, Eldrassi Conscription and be done with it. But this does hand though, that's the thing. Like, you just handle Graveyard, which is what makes it unique. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Okay. So they could duplicate Storm Herald if you want more copies of Storm Heralds. Plucking from your hand means you don't need to expose yourself to Graveyard Hate, although you won't be getting card advantage if you do that. But the optionality is nice, and I feel like the aura slash equipment space is getting new tools all the time, and most of them are like random commander stuff, but like every once in a while, like one is better than it looks. I think just from Dominaria United, we got this new Danatha, and we got the... Astor Bearer of Blades, which is a four drop. Like there could be something here that uh, we just haven't actually like found yet because we haven't looked. Deep enough. All right, I'd more take us home for the last one. And I'm gonna take us home for the last pick then. Lithoform Engine. Beautiful card, super grindy card. Form a legendary artifact with three activated abilities. First one, pay two and tap. Copy target activated or trigger ability you control. You may choose new, co new targets, of course. Three mana and tap. Copy target instant resource spell you control. You may choose new targets. And four mana and tap. Copy target permanent spell you control. This spell becomes a, a token, of course. Chris and Bright, my monthly nomination is Lethal Form Engine. It came out when I got into Magic. I'm sure it triggered Brewing at the time, but maybe worth revisiting with the power creep we have seen since. So Lithoform Engine, 4 mana to cast, a bunch more mana to activate. So we're kind of in that commander space, but once you're paying that much mana, you're going to get something absurd. And all three of these abilities are absurd in their own way. They don't really synergize together, but you're probably going to build a deck that only needs one of the three effects. right? Copying abilities, mm -hmm. copying spells, copying permanence. Generally, I, I think you go for, for first plus third. Like, a lot of the time in your deck, like... like if you're playing like a card deck, you can really use in the mid game the copy target minus two or such and the tap for four in the late game when you have a lot of resources. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So you can actually go infinite fairly simply with this, um, with Teferi who slows the sunset, because Teferi's ability untaps an artifact and a land. And you just copy that, so you get it twice, and then you end up untapping the Lithform engine. Mm. You just need a land that for three. Yeah, Nykthos would be your land. So, I mean, like, this is like, what do they call it now? Bant Ramp, the mono green splash to three <laughs> <laughs> in Pioneer. I'm not actually sure if they play with the Form Engine or not. I assume they don't. I was going for something simpler, like Kairu plus any enchantment, like Wolf Willow Haven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All the land has to do is make two mana, and then you can just keep doing this. I mean, this, I feel like that's kind of what you have to do with this. You know, I don't, I don't see a world in which playing a four mana artifact that costs at least two uh, to activate. You know, I don't see how doing that fairly is going to ever win you any games in today's fire design. Just going spicy with Prison Tron. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Double the bridge is double the fun. Yeah, yeah, what? Yeah, possessed portal. You know, well, it's double our possessed portal. It only costs twelve <laughs> mana. How many portals do you want? And honestly, Possessed Portal is pretty nuts. I used to play it in like, 
<laughs> and like the urza food decks you just have so much mana that nothing matters you just like grab that and then you cast it and it's just like it's you know it's actually wild it just like they it's not card disadvantage because like they skip their draw step first so it's kind of like neutral and then it just like destroys things and then you can after you copy your possessed portal you can then copy the trigger Okay. I mean, yeah, all things are possible when you have infinite mana. So. Yeah, yeah. Is this the best thing to do with 12 mana? Once you have infinite mana, it gets CC. All right, guys, that's 14 cards. What do you make of the current crop of nominees? I mean, we got some solid ones. You know, a lot of them I'd be definitely happy to try out and mess with. You know, I'm, you know, full disclosure, Arayo is my number one choice. That's going to be voting for Arayo. But there's a whole bunch of other, you know, cards I will also be voting for. Who would have said so? That would have never crossed my mind. Well, I'm shocked. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, a lot of cool cards. I mean, a lot of these I would be definitely happy to mess with. I have been told that whatever I choose is going to lose. So I'm going to say... I'm between a Ryo... I knew you would. I know, I'm just dragging you down with me. <laughs> I'm picking the cards I really don't want to brew around. So I'm picking a Ryo... Casting the evil eye right now. This is the sorcery at work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While Emmy is choosing, I mean, we know that Zach has thrown his lot in with mechanized production. Very cool card. David is not here with us today, but I believe he would vote for Necrotic Ooze. Yeah. Not sure what Brian would choose. Brian Madden, the Artificer. Uh, probably the copy thing. Mechanized production. That's a very Brian card for sure. I'm torn between... I, Jota's actually kind of cool. Spreading Algae is cheap, and that's good. You know, I just want Aggressive Mining to be like a different card. I want it to be a cheaper version of itself, and then I would for sure be brewing with that. <laughs> Ever since this card showed up as nominated, I've been thinking about it every day and like, getting <laughs> frustrated that it's not cheaper. But it's such a cool card. Um, yeah, I'm torn. I'm intrigued to see what the people choose. So I have decided I want, I want my winners to be March of Portioning Life and Erayo. <laughs> Respect. Those are the kind of more ones to win. And not ironically, I want aggressive mining to win just because I want to break that. Oh boy. <laughs> I still have not financially recovered from my first experiments with the card. Exactly. But... I just want a good excuse. Better than gear up or orrery. Yeah. Clearly better. Well, the good news is that we don't have to choose, right? It's not up to us, <laughs> it's up to you. So we're now formally opening the voting. Uh, we'll leave it open for about a week or so. Uh, you can find that if you hop in our Discord, there'll be a link there. And, you know, there's time to sway the public to your side. So get in there, start arguing for your cards. Let people know. Throw some ideas around. The more ideas you share, the more people are, like, drawn like moths to a flame to the sweet bruise. <laughs> also, I'm going to give a tiny share of that that nobody cares anything about. A few days ago, actually, like, a week or two ago, a lot of cards from Baldur's Gate enter MDGO. And it seems Popper has been completely destroyed by initiative and not in the way people expect. Like, not in the mid-range way, but rather turn one Dark Ritual, Dark Ritual, and get initiative. And literally the best decks in the format are just Turbo Initiative. I have no idea what that even means. <laughs> what the heck is initiative? <laughs> this is the Undercity dungeon? Exactly. Something like that? The response to this was literally a lot of... Magic Pros and LSB saying, what, what, is, what is initiative? I cannot tell you what it does. Nobody can. I know it's like a special dungeon, but it has its own rules and... It's, it's just its own dungeon. Nothing less, nothing more. I'm trying to like figure out how that relates to anything we've been talking about at all. <laughs> more it's like, wait, wait. Before we go, we I was, must yeah. talk about the initiative. Before we go, I must just say, a whole format is getting wrecked by a format at 1-5 that if it's blocked, it is 5 damage to face. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so yeah, with that, I'm releasing you from the ropes, everybody. <laughs> Dan's face was all I needed to see. Completely devastated. Like, yeah, that'll put a nice bow on this episode. I mean, we're wrapping things up. Clearly. You know, we went a little bit long, but that's okay. You know, he lights and up perfectly. a nice call to action, go vote for cards, but also go learn about the initiative and the Undercity Dungeon. <laughs> if I don't give random data, nobody will. Respect. Oh my gosh. Also, I really hope I really hope March doesn't win, because if March wins, I'm just going to have to play Seven Dwarves. 
Okay. Now <laughs> I know that we've gone on too long. The podcast has gone too long. <laughs> like, not this episode, but the podcast itself. Like, Fairless <laughs> Ruin has gone too long. Exactly. When Seven Dwarfs is on the table. <laughs> 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 the dreadful day. All right. I think uh, that's our sign to call for today. So, Emmy. Thanks so much. Arun, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Dan. Right back at you. Nice to see you, Mord. Got to see Zach, too. It's a good day. Good day. Bye-bye, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Decklists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time as we brew with Soul of Windgrace and share our results with Ether Channeler. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.